50 years from now, I just hope, I hope mental health is, is health. You know, it's not, it's not distinguished from physical health and it's one, one holistic view and that we've harnessed and wrestled technology in general in a way that is net positive for, for humanity and not net negative. And that the solutions and software that come along to support it are, are hyper focused on, you know, making our lives better. And that's a pretty high, 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 like vision y set of answers, but I think, I think yeah. that's the best I can hope for. So, welcome to the Future Psychiatry Podcast, where we explore novel technology and new innovations in mental health. I'm your host, Dr. Bassi, an addiction physician and biomedical engineer. If you're joining for the first time, I would greatly appreciate if you subscribe and share with your friend network and social media. Also, additional resources, a full transcript, and a discussion forum can be found on our website. Thanks for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the discussion today. Well, today we have Ram Krishnan. He's the CEO of Valent, which he has been since 2020. And Valent is an EHR system designed for behavioral health professionals. And I understand it was designed by a psychiatrist, Dr. David Lishner. I think that's a really attractive point to a lot of new users because they want to know it was designed by someone who knows their pain points and not some corporate entity that doesn't have the quite the same experience. And I hear that all the time when discussing EHR systems. So I think it's going to be a fun conversation because you're the first individual I have on here talking about EHR systems. A lot of the time, you know, when we talk about treatment, future treatment plans, we talk about new medications, novel treatments, but this EHR systems have such a huge role in patient satisfaction, clinician satisfaction, patient outcomes. You know, they're, they're the central hub there of all information moves through the EHR system. So I thought it was very fitting to talk to somebody, especially a CEO of a, a major EHR system like Valent. And I want to pick your brain a little bit and talk a little bit about Valent itself specifically and EHR systems. So Tell me a little bit more about Valent and why it was initially intended to focus on behavioral health. Yeah, thanks. First of all, Bruce, thanks for having me on your podcast. It's it's a, it's a lot of fun to get a chance to talk to people about how how we think and how we build things. And also, you know, often I think in our um, our industry, the EHR isn't exactly the 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 the, the word three letter word that people love to to say positive wonderful things about and you know at the end of the day it's a group of people that's our team working on and trying to solve problems and and I think exposing some of that is is helpful not just on behalf of us as a company but our industry because I think there are many of us that have worked at different companies and places and we all we are all here for a similar passion and purpose even if uh, you don't always feel it on your end I think our intent and our, our desires are are to solve problems and and, and improve healthcare. No, you bring up a good point. They get a bad reputation, I think, because people use them to do work. So no matter how good you make an EHR system, if it feels like it's creating more work for me, I'm going to be angry at it. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I, I was thinking about this analogy the other day, and, and I think it's really appropriate for healthcare. One of, one of our customers referred to our product as the operating system of their business. And if you think about operating systems in software, like you're on a computer right now and so am I, there's really one dominant operating system out there, Microsoft, followed by a second Mac OS, and then maybe a distant third, I'll give some credit to Google Chrome, you know, the Chrome OS. So there's three operating systems that most of humanity has to learn how to use. And there are probably a thousand electronic health records out there. And, and so we have a whole lifetime of practice on these three operating systems for using computers, but in the operating system of our jobs in healthcare, there are thousands. So moving, if you move from one practice to another, you have to learn an entire new operating system. I yep. mean, people won't switch from an Android phone to an Apple or vice versa because they're anchored in on the way it works. And so that's a big challenge, you know, to, to overcome. The original question you asked, part of the impetus of founding the business is we had a, our, we were founded by a psychiatrist, Dr. David Lishner, and he ran a psychiatry practice in Seattle. It's the evidence-based treatment centers of Seattle. Great practice, very focused on outcome measures and, and trying to create objective evidence and, and measurement-based care. One of the or, you know, early proponents of value-based care and measurement-based care. And, f and he just felt like this is, I, I say this all the time, it's that tale as old as time, right? There wasn't a system suitable for his discipline and his domain. It was, everything was generic for healthcare in the outpatient setting and not specific to psychiatry or mental health in the private practice setting. And so mm -hmm. he had a brother who wrote code 
And the two of them got together and said, why don't we take a crack at this? And they did. And, yeah. and that was the founding. And their first customer was his own practice. And I think that, that, that beginning, starting there with that perspective in mind, makes all the difference in establishing the tone, the culture, and the way you think about designing products. That's pretty awesome. That's neat. What is it like working behind the scenes at Valent? Maybe we'll talk a little bit more specifically about Valent as a company and its culture, and then talk a little bit more bigger picture. Yeah, we, we've, we've gone through some changes. You know, we were uh, like many, many other companies, we were based in an office in Seattle. And when the pandemic hit, we quickly pivoted to a remote culture. So our workforce is now primarily working from home and working from home, not just in Seattle anymore, but in places all over the place. I, I, I'm the CEO of the company. I live in San Diego, California. We have a big workforce in Seattle, but we've gotten really adept at working from home. And similar to kind of our founder focus on outcomes in his practice, that's really how we run too. We were really outcomes focused in terms of production on the team. We, we do a lot of trust. We do a lot of you know, focusing on people being able to manage their own schedules and time as long as they're delivering the output and making the commitments that they have for each other. We've made a very clear purpose, mission, and vision that we've set for the company. And we've used that to guide our decision-making with how we make investments in our product and as a team. If I can, I'll read a couple of those to you because they're sure. helpful yeah. in, in the way we've even incorporated words and language. So our purpose is to make the world a mentally healthier place. And we, we state that specifically because our focus is on mental health. Our focus is in behavioral health. If we have an opportunity in that spans multiple disciplines or goes into another area or asks us to make software development changes that help support primary care or to help support dermatology, not that that would, you know, it's a logical connection, but we, we're likely to say no because it doesn't line up directly with our purpose which is studying and becoming experts in this discipline and understanding what our customer problems are. Even in our customer base, the wide variety of challenges for us to solve are profound enough without trying to go dabble into other disciplines. 100%. Yeah, and so we then we set a mission. Our, our mission is built around providing technology and services that connect behavioral health patients and their providers when and how they need care in a way that improves outcomes for all. And those outcomes are clinical, they're financial, they're operational, all three. So, and we, we said, said it that way because the places in which the care is happening is evolving, right? It, it's not always office-based. It's becoming in conjunction with office-based, it's becoming a hybrid and often remote. And I think I really feel down the road, it'll also become sustained after the session, right? So after the appointment or the session, there is that time between sessions where the patient or client is still needs support to ensure that whatever is in your treatment plan continues to be top of mind and continues to happen. And whether that's remembering to take a medication or it's remembering to be mindful or jotting down things that you're grateful for or checking your, your frame of view, all these things are what the, the happens in between sessions that, that are also part of the care continuum. Mm -hmm. That's our mission. And then our last thing is I'll give our vision and then I'll stop there. And that's just, you know, we stated that we wanted to be a one-stop shop for our, our behavioral health practices for their ever-changing needs. And that just means we have to be students of the market, students of the industry, and we need to do our best to try to be ahead of, of the changes, interpret the changes and make sure we're there to help, help with them as they evolve. So Valent specifically is designed more towards behavioral health clinicians. And what types of features are more attractive to behavioral health clinicians? Is it the fact that there's more measurement-based care integrated within Valent? Probably not as much image annotation types of features because we don't really need that in psychiatry. But anything off the top of your head about what specifically about Valent would make a psychiatrist more attracted to it versus another EHR system? Yeah, great, great question. And I think I'll even maybe I'll, I'll take that back a layer and say what problems are unique to psychiatry or psychotherapy or the discipline of behavioral health? What's unique? And there are some obvious examples and then some less obvious examples. So I'll maybe give you a few. On the measurement based care side, you know, understanding that for us, you know, PHQ 9 is our version of taking blood pressure in a way, right? Like it's the measure, it is I'm using that as one example. There are right. hundreds of measures you could choose from, but that's one most people know. And it's a measurement that starts at the beginning, 
take it again, you know, months later to track improvement and understanding that that needs to be executed throughout the, the workflow, patient flow and the provider flow isn't just a transactional feature that you have the ability to deliver PHQ-9 and measure it. It, it goes beyond that. It goes to, okay, at intake, I want that to be a part of the intake packet that goes out and it comes back in. I want to capture that discrete information and capture a score that is going to be chartable over time. So I can show progress visually to my patient. I can have that progress visualized in the chart and I can have that progress visualized in a report that I send to a payer to get paid for. As an example, that whole thread mm -hmm. designing the feature set to understand its purpose, not just activate its capability is it is a fundamental thing we're trying to change along that way at a ph is really simple nine questions with a scale but what you score on each question means something specific potentially as an aggregate and one of the the really i think powerful features our founder really spent time understanding and building knowledge around was when the patient or client fills out that score, generating narratives that are attached directly to what that score is, right? So when you're doing your progress note or you're documenting, to have a baseline narrative already written for you that you can edit it, edit is important for standardizing care and just driving efficiency. So you're just, that's not something you'll see in a multi-specialty EHR, right? That's something you'll have to study your domain to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you'd have to probably copy paste the results from that and it's a, an added step for a lot of EHR systems, I think. It's not integrated into a narrative that you can utilize and edit right. thereafter. With a chart that's visualized the progress that you can put into a report to send to a payer to get paid more if you're getting bonused on it. To send to the patient in an app so they can see that. Visualizing progress is powerful for, for clients and patients too, right? To see the visual. I may not feel great today when I walked in to talk to you. But if I track, if I showed my, that this is making a difference, your scores are, are declining, they're getting better, that, that's helpful. Another really simple example, and this is more on the therapy side, is we have a very extensive feature set on group therapy. Group, groups are not, you don't do group dermatology or group podiatry, right? That's a really different understanding of a domain. Everything from group, how to, how to register a group together that's active together at a time to tracking a group note, a group progress note. Splitting that all now into a way that bills eight different ways for eight different pairs of people that are in a group session, mm -hmm. executing a group telehealth session. It just it is very specific in that in that regard. And then maybe one last example here is because we have lots of these, but but a good one. I like this one because it it was one that we like many of our ideas come from customers, right? Giving us direct feedback. And when the pandemic hit. The first thing everyone had to do is figure out how to get on one of these sessions with their clients. And the easiest thing in their right in front of their hands was to grab Zoom, which took off during the pandemic. And then right behind that, people started realizing they had some of that capability with Teams, which is a really great stopgap in the short run. But one of the things that was a, an unintended consequence was that we put an additional administrative burden on the provider. So as a psychiatrist, if you were used to having somebody show up to your office and start with an administrator at the front desk to ensure paperwork was complete, co-pays were taken, whatever other things you needed to get done were taken care of. And then you saw the patient. But in the advent of the Zoom teams, we just dropped patients right on your lap and said, <laughs> you know, you should start taking payment now. You need to get this, make sure this assessment's done. You need to make sure their appointment, you know, the next appointment is there. All this went right on you. And we, that was feedback we got from a client and, and we started to realize that's consistent across our customer base. And one of the things we, we ended up building our own telehealth solution and our telehealth solution is integrated with a lots of different parts of our system. So when a patient now gets a link to start their appointment and they'll click on it, the first thing they're presented with is our virtual administrator who will say, Hey, before you start this session, you have a $20 copay, your credit card's already on file. Can we take that? now and that part's out of the way you need to fill this assessment before we get started that's was your deliverable for this week's session and if it's quick we just do it quickly online right and any other any other administrative work gets done digitally and it's great because the provider if the patient didn't like that then love having to do that the provider can always blame their ehr right in that case we're happy to take the blame in that case because it just sort of takes that that the sacredness of your relationship with your patient, it gives it back to you. Mm -hmm. In that point specifically, in that example, 
I, it reminds me of what you were saying at the beginning of this session before we started recording about how the greatest feature about your EHR system is ease of use and the greatest drawback can be ease of use too. Because when you were giving that example, I thought of a couple other clinicians I had spoken to recently, how they have a patient population that is very rural and all they care about is clicking one button, one button specifically, and seeing a person there and not having to deal with logging yeah. in, doing forgot password, two token, you know, op authentication, oh, <laughs> yeah. doing another screener. So it's like, I love how streamlined that is, but then I know for a fact it won't fit the needs of everybody, which is the challenge that you have. How do you, how do you work that? It's a great question. And I told you we were going to go all kinds of places <laughs> in the conversation. And it's a good one. It's the, it's the, and I love that you brought that up because that is at the, at the heart of software design here. Our biggest challenge is that the provider base and the client base are not uniform. You know, they're not mm -hmm. automatons. There's a wide variation in patient type from the rural example you gave to senior seniors to English mm -hmm. as a second language to different pair. There's a wide range. Right. And so I, I think it's hard to get it right for everybody. I think what we try to do whenever we can is create optionality. So the example I gave you with that virtual admin, you can also shut that off and you can skip it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do that. It's not mandatory as part of the workflow. It's a you opt in for that as a feature set that you can turn on because it makes sense for your client population and it makes sense for your providers and it makes sense for your practice. But if it doesn't, in the example you gave, you just don't turn that on. Right, right. But you can imagine as each of these like permutations start start getting built and you have multiple on off switches, you suddenly have a, a, a product and a service that's so feature rich, but is a sea of features that a, a secondary challenge for us is how do you have get, create all this optionality and all this functionality, but make it easy still for people to use? And right. how do you, and the flip side of that is, how, how do you get people to discover all these things that they're there after mm -hmm. they've been using it for years? And those are also subsequent challenges. And they, they really point to that ease of use. Some people have really fine tuned and, and optimize it to meet their needs. And some people, you know, they take it out of the box and we don't go, they don't go much further than that and start hitting constraints. And it speaks to even here, it's a continuing education environment. I can tell you, I still discover new features in Excel to this day that I course, yeah. I wake up and learn and go, oh man, if I do that, <laughs> it would save me, I don't know how many hours of, of, of work. So, so I think yeah, these are all some of the big challenges that we run into. Yeah, that's, it's a really interesting topic. One that I really enjoy just chatting about because, you know, in graduate school, I, I took a few courses on usability and for audience members, you know, they, you can really get very granular when you're measuring usability, how much you know, how often are you using the mouse? How often, how many clicks are you making per patient that are not related to the note perhaps? And how do you, you know, measure this data and then also interpret it too, when there probably is a little bit of variability there among the clinician's day, depending on who they're seeing. And, and then incorporating that into your product development side to improve your, your product. It's just really, really kind of cool. I, I like that because you have a way of having a, a very large impact. In fact, when you're just tinkering with maybe the location of, of one link, but if it's done with a million different clinicians or a million different visits throughout one day, you know, four seconds times a million is you're saving the entire country, <laughs> like a, a lot of time right there. That's pretty, yeah. pretty neat. If you think about it that way, what, what types of um, usability features have you measured with your team and what yeah. have you done with that data? I love that you've studied it before because it is a science. And unfortunately though, when you're doing it here, you find that it's not a science of the median or the mean or the, or even the mode, right? Where you're looking at, okay, if I do this, half of the people will benefit from like the average person will benefit, uses this route in the product and they'll benefit from this change. It's also, but we, we live in the, in sometimes in the, on the, on the other, the two sides of the distribution curve. And often that's where you get the most noise. And so the, mm, most the, vocal people. the most vocal people are on those edges and they can sometimes drive you away from what the median or the mean is, right? It's, it's a, it's a, it's really important to have objective evidence and data to help you make design decisions, or you will end up listening to the loudest people on the fringes. 
and make everything inefficient for the median in the middle, right? Like, a, and so we do, we do a handful of things. And I'd say there's some that are big, big activities, some that are kind of standard activities. And so we recently redesigned an entire patient portal experience. And that was how we, we, we rebuilt it. We relaunched our new version in the fall. It's a mobile app and it's a, and it's a it's web-based as well. So we have both components to it for the patient to interact with our providers in the practice. And we hired a third party, to be frank, like we hired a third party. We told, we had them interview our practices and the providers and their patients, whatever they signed up for it. Wow. We, we had them do the interviews. We, so we had to take our bias out of it, right? So our design bias and our historical bias, we had them go interview them all and then come back with the top five. What are the most important work streams that we need to build? how to optimize them based on this feedback. And they came back with a design paradigm for us. And they also tested it back with their surveyed users. And so that was an important way to design a feature set on a, on a strategic basis. And in usability, there are things you do where you, you articulate what the task is and you measure the time it takes people to do the task. And that removes your design bias, right? I love the way like this image looks. I love the beauty of this design. And it turns out nobody, nobody can, nobody can <laughs> figure out what to do. Like it looks beautiful, but no one has any idea how to do the job, the task. Right. And then you have like a Google, which is the most rudimentary basic design, but everybody knows how to do it. So that you look at task time, you look at task error rate, you look at a handful of these types of metrics that give you some indication objectively, whether your design is consistently achieving the result on the other end. And so like, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's a series of ways we did it on a big design. And then we, we actually use a user flow tracking software in our product. So we have click paths that we can aggregate and see like what, what page does everyone start on every day? At what time of day, what day of week, what type of user, you know, it's all aggregated and like anonymized, but it's, it, it gives us what the usage flows are and that, what do they, mm -hmm. people tend to do in our product? There's five ways to do things. Which one is the one most people are using? And then going back eventually to think through, how do I optimize that? It's a tricky thing because like I was saying back with that, that like that uh, you're getting used to your operating system. One of the things, even though people like want things to be easier, they also just sometimes don't want things to change. So knowing <laughs> that I go boop, 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 boop every day and there's muscle memory to that, like when you suddenly have me just go boop, boop, just need different know. spots. Uh, you're you hitting, can... you're hitting all the, the sensitive topics here for a clinician. Yeah, you can see how that, like, it is, you watch a clinician, it's a lot of mu muscle memory, right? Your CRM is probably filled with a lot of users maybe giving you features, new feature requests. And I, there are a couple of companies, and you're probably familiar with this, but maybe some listeners aren't, but you can essentially crowdsource new features where a user will post something and then other people can upvote it, kind of like a Reddit style thing where you up mm -hmm. and downvote particular features. What is it like in the, the back end in the office where, how do you decide upon, where am I going to steer the ship now? Like you probably can, there's only so much time and resources that you have as a company and you, and there's a million infinite number of different ways you can improve a product, especially given how fast things are moving now with AI. How do you decide what's important? Yeah, it's, it's a great question and it's not an easy answer. I think we have multiple ways we do it. So we do similar upvoting kind of style, except that we, in our CRM, we will, we'll categorize what all the feature requests are. We'll document them. And then every time a request comes in, we'll add a vote to it. So that's one input for us is, is that kind of classic style. It's not necessarily opened up to the entire, like, as, 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 as a website like Reddit, but we do that internally inside right. of our CRM. Yeah. We have a number of user groups that meet independently of us. They're organized, self-organized and managed, but they offer us participation in them and they'll aggregate requests at times. And then we, the third area is we have an advisory board and that is a representative sample of the market. So it's not all gigantic, multi-state, you know, the, the biggest, largest practices, it spans those all the way down to a solo practice. And, you know, we have tried to get that group together at different times and get them to react to things that are happening in the, the industry and the market at large, right? So new trend is coming in. How many of you care about this? How many of you are worrying about this? How many of you think you're going to do something about it? How many of you want us to do something about it? And it's, it's, and, and flip side of that is what are your top three challenges and what do you struggle with. And it's important. I've done these a bunch in my life because what happens is you walk, you as a, some, a member, a participant will walk in 
with what you think is the most important thing until you hear other people bring up their most important things. And suddenly you realize that actually, I'd prefer that you worked on that than this. And right. in, in doing it in isolation, one-on-one, -on -one, you miss the richness of the conversation, the debate and the hashing out of what's really valuable and important to the group at large. And for us, it profoundly reduces the chances that we make a mistake in what we build. Like we build, we spend all our time and money in the wrong thing. And it opens our eyes to things we never considered. That company that you used, they, you mentioned one of the first things they did, they interviewed clinicians. Did, did Valent incorporate any of that style or approach into gaining feedback? Or is that something you might yeah, consider in the future? That's a wonderful follow-up. I didn't bring that up. When we, you know, I joined, I took over the company in October of 2020 and brought in some kind of experienced veterans that I've worked with that have done a lot of this in healthcare before. And we've gone through a life, lifetime of mistakes. Okay. So we've gone through and built stuff that nobody, nobody wanted, nobody bought because we thought we were cool and got <laughs> humble and learned that building cool things is not necessarily what people will benefit from. And, you know, one thing he put in place, our CTO is on every like moderately sized feature that we build uh, any like that's going to not a one week job, but a multi-month like product enhancement that we do. Each one has to have five customers attached to it. And so five customers somewhere out there have to care about it enough that they're willing to sign up to be part of a group that will review designs before we start writing code. And we'll see early iterations of the product to give us feedback about whether it's any good or not. And, so that's even before uh, it's rolled out to the public. It's before it's rolled out. And oh, no, that, that's awesome. We use an agile development approach, which is we basically do is we, we deliver code every two weeks to the, to the product. We update the product every two weeks with whatever's been complete and is 100% done, we, we, up, we launch to the, to the market. Some of these take multiple iterations. It's really tough for me as a CEO to, to, to plan exact dates things will release because I totally. have to give the team the, the grace and the space. If the customer group comes back and says, you really, I won't use this without these three things that you didn't think of when you did the design. They're critical. And that feedback is, becomes vital to us saying, okay, we then should push this out a month, incorporate their feedback because it won't get used without that. And consequently, we will always go to, we'll, we will start with a list of 500 things that we could possibly put on there that our team internally is really passionate about and thinks are the right thing. Inevitably, the customers will find three we didn't think of and they'll, they'll, they'll take the 500 on the list and toss most of them we don't need. And that also saves us time and money from building the wrong things. And it increases the probability of us being right when we take it to market. Mm -hmm. The other thing we do is we then, after we release to market, we know we're going to miss stuff because the market is varied. And until it's out in the wild, people who start using it then start bringing up all kinds of marginal use cases or even obvious use cases we all missed, including the group that was with us. And we try to leave another month to two months after the product's released to do a fast follow-up on all the feedback we're getting from the market. So those are the ways we, we try to incorporate customers in our, in our, and it's a, it's an evolutionary process, right? Like you get better at it over time. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. I like those examples that you gave. Were there any others that you felt like would be a absolute hit and maybe it was just a dud that you can yeah, share? I, I, I think, I think it's more sometimes like the timing of things like is, is item a more important than item B? Mm -hmm. I, I'd love to give the inverse of that. Cause I think that, that was one that like that we didn't, we didn't appreciate. We launched a mini CRM in our product this fall. And when we got our advisory board together, that was probably number 10 on our list or 15. It was pretty low mm -hmm. on our internal list that we thought was important. But from the small practice to the large practice, every single one of them brought that up as a market need that we were missing, that the market was missing. And this is capturing, just capturing prospective patients up front in the off your website, off of a web form, off of a third party site, bringing them into a holding area and being able to manage them effectively before turning them into patients, either putting them in a holding pen, putting them in a wait list, being able to communicate that with them in that world where that while they're in that state, we've done some additional work that also takes the criteria that the patient filled out in the form and understand criteria that describes the provider and tee up the ide ideal match. So that says mm -hmm. patient, you know, has this, these indications is on this insurance is looking for a male, an Asian male provider, you know, just what, whatever there's both demographic and um, treatment type and pair type in some cases, and making sure we're matching that with the right provider in the group that would, would fit. And we had that way down on the list, but that that's 
been the one of the most widely, I think, anticipated and, and well-received feature that we we rolled out and spent a lot of time and money on that we would not have had at the top of our list before. Interesting. You mentioned an example of how you mentioned there were three operating systems, basically, you know, Windows, Mac, maybe Chrome. Yeah. And, you know, everyone has to just basically get used to using those. But I think the the analogy is good, but the operating systems, they also have third parties that allow you to build apps and software to improve upon the user's experience of that operating system. And I know some EHR systems, they allow third-party integration now. Does does Valent allow that? And you know, I, this could probably can be a larger conversation because it introduces a lot of other challenges when you start to allow third parties to to work within your EHR system. But what decision has been made about about using third party apps or software and integrating it into Valent? Yeah, I think I think it's hard to be completely restrictive. I'll give you a, I'll give you a spectrum here. There is the spectrum of my EHR and practice management solution do these base sets of things, and everything else will just open it up for you to plug in any third party you want. So that we, if you want to do the, the Zoom example I gave you, just use Zoom. If you want to, we're not going to build any of that stuff. You can plug in all these other 50 things into your product. Exactly. And, and it, Scheduling. It, it, there's so many. Yeah. There's so and many instantly there. you've solved them at a checkbox like level, but you haven't really solved any workflow. If anything, you've made, work for, made workflow more challenging. You've made it multi-system. You've got data in lot, like 50 screens. And so that's, that's an end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum is we're completely closed box. If we don't build it, you don't get it. You know, and I think we're trying to find the balance in, in, in between there. And we don't have a wide open API platform that anybody can code to and do, it, do whatever they want. We have been thoughtful about the things that we're trying to build that we inside of our product that you could acquire as a third party, because we think the out, outcome of workflow is better if it's native, doing mm -hmm. appointment reminders, doing, you know, payment collection, doing telehealth, doing measures and forms and, and that kind of thing. We think those are you can de define and design all kinds of specific workflows that make your life better if they're all well integrated. I think we're, we'll work our way towards a middle ground where we have some set of APIs. We have a couple APIs today for patient insertion and things like that. We don't get enough consistent demand on a lot of the other ones to, to build out a fully fledged wide open API platform, but it, we're, not, we're not philosophically opposed to it. We are just going to let the market demand drive our building of them. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Has there been much user requests for AI integration? And another probably podcast in itself, how is AI going to help and assist a clinician and patient experience? One of your mission statements was allowing them to connect. And I know one potential feature for AI that's maybe a low hanging fruit is keying up a, a message for a clinician after they've seen eight hours of patients, they probably are responding to 10 to 20 of very similar types of questions. Refills, I'm sure a lot of them get categorized into a couple of buckets of basic types of, of questions, some of which can possibly, a message can be started by an AI system. And then <clears throat> hopefully somebody will review it and edit it and then send it out to the patient. Maybe that can save some time. But what are your thoughts on AI bigger picture? Maybe we can start off there and how it integrates into EHR systems. Yeah, I, I think I think the example you gave is a great one. It's a low hanging fruit opportunity. It's very similar to the auto narrative generation example I gave earlier when a measure comes in and a note is pre started with an automatic narrative. In most of us, we often do prescription requests through a secure message of some sort. So having that, that's something we build built ourselves with exactly what you said in mind, which is understanding what the type of request is and having templates that you can use to to send your response to, so you're not typing it up every time. And, and also just making sure your inbox isn't full of administrative questions. If it's a billing question, it should route differently than it does a prescription right. refill. Understanding that kind of thing, I think is really super low hanging fruit and independent of the chat GPTs and all those announcements coming out. I'll give you an internal one and then I'll give you a patient provider one is I've, we've thought about, you know, we're already doing the data analysis on streamlined workflows. And as this technology evolves, it can write code also. And being able to feed it our workflow data on the on the paths and have it come back and optimize them would be an interesting internal science experiment for us to start applying and yeah. seeing if it can come up with better objective, faster routes for people to do tasks. 
and, and that could rapidly accelerate the amount of flexibility we can offer from client to client. It's hard to do it when you're writing, you know, you have labor that's writing code and ha you can't create 50 permutations. But if you have code, creating code, like that, that opens up a whole world of possibility. That really reduces the bias that you were talking about earlier. You know, one goal is to eliminate bias of, of the attachment bias that you have to your product, right? And 100%. And yeah, and even attachment bias to the way people give feedback, right? They often give us feature feedback and not a problem they're trying to solve. That's the one thing we were always trying to get to. Okay, what problem are you trying to solve? I know you want faster horses, but maybe we'll invent a car, you know, instead of a faster horse as the old Ford example. <laughs> I think we've thought a lot about, you know, I'll just do like food, advanced food for thought here on where it could go. There's so many places and it's every day I think we're coming up with new theories. I, I saw a post yesterday of, of someone using chat GPT to play Dungeons and Dragons. Like they used it as the dragon dungeon master to get geeky. If any of your this is geeky at all. And, and it, <laughs> it, it, it runs through an entire campaign with, with prompts, which is, which is, which is profoundly, you know, just interesting in that application in, in our world, imagine like the, 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 the current model, the, the big advancement with chat, G, G, chat GPT, it doesn't have custom data sets. Right. And so I think the world over the next three years, having this released to the wild will be people taking and training custom, custom data sets, using that AI technology to advance and improve something specific to the domain. In our world, we have diagnosis codes, we have treatment plans, we have procedure codes, we have um, progress notes, and you really have telehealth scripts, just like, you know, we're recording right now, this thing is converting our audio into text. So is every telehealth trans, trans, you know, session ever, you could take the transcripts of those and feed a learning engine. And mm -hmm. the outcome from that, in the, in that in the first mode would be back to your example of helping pre-build some of the, the, the note is being your assistant, your second set of objective eyes. So you can really focus on the patient, take all that into account and pre-build the narrative for you to edit, highlighting keywords, maybe things in the second and third wave of this, it, incorporating the actual audio for tone, for inflection, especially if you can compare it to prior sessions where tone and, and inflection work a certain way. Uh, with video, it would be expressions changing. And then the most invasive and kind of scary model would be a little agent sitting on your device saying like, you had, your client hasn't been mobile for two weeks. Like they've been in the same room, right? Like you, you can just, if you add all this up, you can imagine that either we will have 10 times as many data inputs to do something with, or the machine will assist us with all that. So we can be more present and empathetic with the client in front of us while the machine gathers all the insights and presents us with the analysis. And then you have quantitative and qualitative coming together to finish, finish your, your documenting your session. It's an interesting perspective idea of incorporating AI, but I think What's going to happen goes back to what you said earlier. I think some of the resistance is going to be from clinicians, basically resisting change. And I think that's going to be the biggest barrier because I, I think actually a lot of patients do like new ideas of how to improve efficient care. But it reminds me of how prior to COVID, one of the biggest barriers that I felt as a clinician was not only like intra-professional stigma, they always felt like a a telehealth doctor was just kind of, you know, in the wild, wild west, they didn't, they weren't as thorough perhaps. Yeah. And then the other barrier was, was payer based, but a lot of patients actually wanted it. They felt like it was more convenient. I feel like we're going to go down a pretty similar path with AI where maybe people like you and me will be interested in it, but to get the, the mass of clinicians on board with something, listening to your conversation and writing your note for you and like taking it the next step. I feel like will be a, a really slow endeavor, but, but I think we have to start with that low hanging fruit. Probably. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree. And I'll maybe give you another flavor of this outside of mental health, because some of that slow endeavor has been, had started 20 years ago. And I, I'll give you a couple examples there. I'm a, I'm a, an advisor in an AI company in radiology for breast imaging. And this is, this isn't new technology. Some of that stuff we called clinical decision support in the early days, and then called it big data and then machine learning. And today we call it AI. And then now it's AGI, which is actually really is a different thing to, to generative learning. But we, we have, we have you know, on the breast imaging side to, to speak to the resistance, cause you're spot on. Like the breast imaging AI isn't visually looking at images. It's looking at the 
the pixel and voxel data to find patterns over time. So it's not even using eyes, right? It's just looking at the ones and zeros and finding patterns. And it has a higher sensitivity and specificity than the human does looking at the same study, but it's still been resisted and hasn't been adopted or approved for widespread use, you know, in, in, a, in a way that's been meaningful yet, even though that's been around for a while. And it's a lot of the same resistance that you bring up. And then one step even further back was clinical decision support, where we just studied data and patterns. And, and, and I, you know, I was part of a group that studied this at a number of hospitals, and we put together principles for standardizing just administrative practices. Should you order a, an elective C-section for a patient under 37 weeks, the morbidity rate goes up substantially than if you do it after 37 weeks. Really, the most simplest of decision support, like ideals, right, in an ordering. Mm -hmm. And that had massive resistance because every market and every facility was different. They had a different patient population, different providers, different... There's a lot of the there's a lot of the art of healthcare that that I think pushes back against some of this uh, on that end. So I think you're 100 percent right. It's up to us to find the low hanging fruit that we can apply all over the place. I will say radiology is another great like place to look at some of this. They've been dictating their reports through a voice recognition system that has been applying AI to that that text to speech for for a long time, and they've done some I think really powerful things where. You, know, you dictate the report, the report comes up and the, the thing, the critical findings are all highlighted. So if something you've said in the, in the report dictation indicates something that needs to be, then it's essential. It wasn't part of your study. It wasn't what you were looking at, but needs to be communicated back to the referring physician that's highlighted and a decision point has to be made there. I think there's a lot of that technology that exists in other disciplines of healthcare that has been testing this for years that might accelerate bringing that into our market as well. And so that that's, that's maybe another... Another example or twist there that I think gives me hope that some of this can be applied here because we'll have other proof points to point to within healthcare. Mm -hmm. I, I love finding the ways to automate as much of the work that people don't value doing first, because that's the easiest thing to get people to buy into with respect to change. Yep. Yeah. It's interesting watching the market move in regard to AI. I always feel like there's kind of like two camps. There's like people who are really judicious and cautious about moving forward. And then there's the startup companies that want to be disruptors and they just go yeah. and do it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Maybe patients shouldn't be using them directly, but there's, there's like basically AI out there for treating depression, doing mindful meditation. Like you think of it, there's probably somebody who's already creating an app out there for it. So it's like, why not? Maybe we can get some of those judicious people. To, to start the ball rolling because they're gonna do it cautiously and maybe they can come up with ground rules and start to help build trust there between that company and the, the patient and the clinicians as well. And hopefully move, move the needle forward a little bit, a little bit at a time and sit back while some of those startups go under perhaps. <laughs> yeah, and, and I think what's, what's, what's neat about the ecosystem is, is to your point, people will, you know, will just plow forward with the idea, irrespective of whether or not anyone's going to be able to adopt them and or will take them, right? And they'll they'll flare up into the sky, get lots of media coverage, and then they'll yep. fizzle back down just as quickly as they, they went up. But in there are always nuggets of innovation that come out of those that I think tell us things that if we're listening, particularly those myself and not my peers running EHR companies and such, we can, instead of fearing those technologies and instead of your practices fearing those models, like you're doing great work, plow forward, we're doing great work, we plow forward, and we try to think through how to extract the best out of that and bring it to our providers. And mm -hmm. so like you have the calm and the headspace of the world, exactly to your point, there's a thousand mindfulness apps out there. Right. And there's mindfulness is a core part of our, our industry, right? Mindfulness and, and, and meditation and a lot of like this. The, all the neuroscience kind of apps out there, there are elements of those that are really valuable to and being a core part of what providers are deliver, delivering in a treatment plan to their patients. We are sitting there with the EHR between the patient and the provider. And I think as a trusted relationship, bringing those tools into that relationship could be powerful. And when you discharge a patient, giving them a prescribed mindfulness app to continue on in some form of practice afterwards could be a way of ensuring that after you've driven change, you've given them tools to keep them in control. And that would be, to me, a very logical and powerful extraction of that, that, that technology set and that, that content set, and now integrating it into the care path of what you do today. 
And, mm -hmm. you know, for us, we, we launched an app with that in mind, which, which is that, you know, we think there is lots of neat things that have been developed. There's a way to bring that directly to your practice and connect, keep you connected with your patients during the course of care, but also after care to make sure that they, they keep, keep on it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You mentioned clinical decision support in the context of that radiology example. Was there anything that Valent is thinking about incorporating for decision support making for psychiatrists in the EHR system? Because that's a that's a whole other industry in of itself. It could be with prescribing, could be with the note itself, could be with me the messages. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? I think some of that stuff, the, the, the problem set that I articulated before in the hospital setting is even more profound in the outpatient setting. So if it's difficult to get five hospital systems to agree on a set of standards, getting you know 5,000 independent psychiatrists to agree on a set of standards is that problem just exploded, you know, <laughs> tenfold. So I think like the potentials there, the 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 change management problem has just grown exponentially. That's my two cents on it. I don't know. What do you think? You know. I so I, the EHR systems that I've worked with, I feel like part of it is just staying, uh, having that competitive edge. You need to do something that shows that, hey, I, I get my finger on the beat here. AI is where the things are moving. We hear you and we want to try to start to incorporate that, even if it's one feature or something or other. And I think that could be a very attractive thing for certain people, but I it, it, it gets back to how heterogeneous the the customer basis can certainly see people not caring. Some people being like, oh, that's weird. And some people being like, oh, that's really neat. I want to, I'm interested in that. So yeah. it's hard. Yeah, and I, I think, I think our focus will be in, in the areas where we can eliminate repetitive and un, like non-value added work as best as we can yeah. and be an aid and an assistant in all the documentation, this face-to-face -face you and I are doing, it just gets crushed if my head's down typing in any way, shape or form, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and then the end of your day, having to do that, any of that we can, we can work on. I think, I think that's, that's gotta be our primary area of application of all. What this. is it? What's that NVIDIA? I think they have that new AI where it moves your eyeball to the camera yeah. screen. Have you seen yeah. that? And that just probably yeah. eliminated all of those companies that have the, the camera, you know, drop down. Trying to track your eye. Yeah. 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 But now it's like almost too creepy. So that's a really good point of how like AI went way too far. And now it's just like staring at the camera nonstop, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a wild world we're in, man. And I, it's, so I've spent, a, I, I left healthcare for a little bit and spent a little bit of time in the gaming industry as well. And there are a lot of, if we just went a different direction with this, there's a lot of, I think, value in, in understanding so much psych like, like neuroscience and psychological like understanding goes into game design because you're nudging behaviors constantly. It's, it's mm -hmm. all nudging of behaviors and there are really powerful elements of there. We bring AI, but I think we'll bring some of that back into our tool set also, right? Like in, in the language you choose for onboarding clients and getting them to do tasks, the, what, what's the, you, there's so, it's so mechanical right now and software driven instead of empathetic with, with the way a game would work. In, in terms of how they talk to you and kind of take care of you through the the journey, we don't we could we there's a lot for us to gamify in the experience. Like you know, like you're working your way up the ladder of completing the tasks that you've been asked to do, and you're giving positive reinforcement for it. That's 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 simply like using like common practices that exist to get people to feel motivated to to do the tasks before them. And I think our mm -hmm. patient population more than any would benefit from that along the journey. And I think bringing those tools in adds as much the sort of different market value into our, our space, you know, like back to your kind of marrying what's cool and hot with what's really delivering value and what's cool and hot from like a, like a label perspective, but really isn't doing at the end of the day, much exactly. more than yeah. another bullet you can throw up on your, your website or your, your talk track. I think that that's, that's where I think, I think like the next iteration of value-based care, if you actually did sign value-based contracts, we would value the adherence to the treatment plan. We'd value the adherence, the mo motivating people to do the things that we're asking them to do along, you know, a care, care path with the patient, because you'd get some point in time, a real value-based care contract would pay you a fixed amount and you'd want all these tools to ensure that the treatment was being adhered to. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's for skating where the puck will go at some point that that is going to be really important. And it's one we have our eye on to make sure we get ahead of it for all of y'all. 
that was my final question that I wanted to leave you with was where do you see things going in 50 years from now? Do you, do you feel like the number of EHR systems will continue upward? I feel like we've got to reach a critical mass at some point, right? There can't be hundreds of thousands yeah. of EHR systems in, in 50 years. Do you think they're going to consolidate into a few big, I, big I'm players? I'm just thinking or? through 50 years from now. What was 50 years ago? <laughs> 1966, 68, I guess? 1968 was 50 years ago. And think about think about sitting at 1968 and looking ahead. That's, that's, a, big, that's a big distance between the two. I can't even foresee what will happen in 50 years. First of all, I'll be dead. And, and second of all, in 50 years, I don't, you know, for for the way things are advancing with with deep link and and deep mind and just being able to connect directly I, I, all i know is it's going to be an exciting crazy place and the people who are leading the way won't be the folks that are doing it right now right like mm -hmm. i know we look about a year out to 2 years out and that's as far as we we can, we can without like the world changing rapidly 50 years from now mm -hmm. i just hope i hope mental health is is health you know it's not it's not distinguished from physical health and it's one one holistic view and that we've harnessed and wrestled technology in general in a way that is net positive for for humanity and not net negative and mm. that the solutions and software that come along to support it are are hyper focused on you know making our lives better and that's pretty high 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 like vision -y set of answers but i think i think yeah. that's the best i can hope for i like i like the way you put that i like that you mentioned that mental health should just be health. That's a, a great point. And I feel like maybe 50 years from now, EHR should be more patient centric where an EHR is, is basically your EHR as a patient and you go to a clinician or another clinician and they basically have a way of inputting data into your EHR. So that way you can, you can keep it and you can store it and you can understand it and have more value rather than hey, saying, Hey, can I get my data from that place and bring it over here? And are you going to do it on time? Is it, is it going to be a nice, easy path over? But it, so it would be nice if there was a little bit more universality of how they all speak to each other. And I could probably speak to that as a clinician too. You know, patients come from one person to another and I'm, I'm basically recollecting a lot of work that a lot of other doctor probably already did. <laughs> yeah. How much waste is there with doing that? That would yeah. be something that needs to be improved upon, but hopefully down the road. I love that view, and I think it's 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 it, it, to take that two steps further. Not only that, all my biometrics will probably be collected in advance too. <laughs> right, so you're not collecting all of the vitals, and, and and you're not analyzing any of it. It's all like kind of pre telling you exactly. And in many ways, hopefully, we're 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 tr taking care of our own health because it's so easy. Because mm -hmm. you're, to your point, everything is patient centered in that capacity. I like both views. I think they they are totally complementary. I appreciate this conversation. It was really fun, fascinating. I really like your your viewpoint and the, the principles and philosophies that you have within Valent. I can tell when you mentioned, you know, thinking about how words are used on the HR system and thinking about user behaviors is just a level of understanding of the user that I feel like we need right now in, in EHR design moving forward. So I really appreciate your insights today and, and thank you so much. I appreciate the chance to be on the show and talk about it. And, and it's been great. You've been a lot of fun to talk with and, and I'd love to do it again someday.